Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate Acadia Health. I've been collaborating with them for quite a while. I'm the treatment placement specialist. And uh, Julia and Joy, who I've recently been corresponding with, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone who's um, taking a little time out of their day to uh, do a little bit of uh, learning. And I will hope to make this entertaining as well as informative. And so um, this is, of course, what is trauma-informed counseling and what is the science behind it? My name is Paul Krause. I'm a licensed professional counselor. I'm duly licensed in Michigan and Arizona. I've also practiced in Illinois, currently running the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids. Um, and that's at a place called Health for Life Grand Rapids. And I also, in my spare time, have a podcast called the Intentional Clinician Podcast. You can get connected to me through there. I do some behavioral health consulting. I still train a lot of clinicians in Michigan and Arizona. I'm a counseling supervisor and I've got a few other projects going on. A little bit about me. So I've been uh, in practice since 2007 uh, and now a clinical director. So um, there's going to be a definite didactic portion of this uh, because I really want people to grasp the importance of the trauma-informed paradigm because if you have the trauma-informed paradigm, no matter what type of counseling you do or what type of therapy, or what type of medicine you do, you can now start to integrate that information into your uh, treatment methods and interventions immediately. Um, and then if you want, you can get advanced training on it. So this is um, somewhat of uh, some of the basics. So the reason I'm passionate about this is because I um, grew up in a place where there wasn't trauma-informed counseling. And I have uh, also had experiences without trauma-informed care. And I do believe that for a lot of uh, the folks out there that have experienced traumas or, or difficult uh, long-term difficulties, um, they need to have um, advanced modalities of care and advanced knowledge from the practitioner or else they're not going to be able to get um, what they need. So um, I've been learning a lot about this over the past 10 years, uh, actually 11 years I've been involved in this study and uh, this is some of the basics that i picked up that i want to share with you so uh, a little bit about it i think the paradigm is so important before i get into some of the stories so a little bit of the didactics here um, as you know the scientific research on this is relatively new the last 20 years is when they've really started um, honing in on the neurobiology of what trauma is and how life experiences influence in, uh, the spectrum of our human adaptation um, before then, they even Freud and Jung and other people, even back in the 1800s, had noticed uh, results from soldiers going to war, and they called it shell shock, and other things where their behaviors would come back from the war and they'd be completely changed and have these different um, obsessions and different feelings that uh, they never had before the war, different ways of viewing things. Um, a lot of people in our field believe that they could treat this through stories and talking and you can but it does take a lot longer uh than and than using some of the trauma-informed techniques um, and so the trauma influences all of our thoughts behaviors physical health and more and it's not just trauma we'll get into what the definition is but it's key to understanding the entire mind body uh, therapy paradigm which is where our field is going is that the brain is not just located here up in the skull the brain is located throughout our body through the uh, nervous system and your nerves and your autonomic nervous system. And it's a two way street. Your brain doesn't just take information and send it downward, but we've learned from science that the, that the body observes things in a, some, in a pattern that we don't really totally understand because your hands don't have eyes, but your hands observe things and they send that signal up and those can influence us in ways that we're not even fully aware of yet. Um, the more we understand the brain as practitioners, the less we are going to assume, project, or judge our clients and those people around us. And I think that's a very important point to make is that the more you understand the brain and the physiology behind what influences uh, people when, who've experienced any sort of trauma or just anyone in general, um, we're going to be less assumptive, less judgy, uh, not projecting our, our uh, personal experiences onto others. Um, Definitely this presentation, I'm just gonna outline some of the copious amounts of research that have proven this trauma-informed uh, care paradigm to be empirically valid, and uh, how to use some trauma-informed counseling techniques to improve outcomes in all healthcare 
we are going to really work on the ingrained cultural notions. Um, and a lot of these cultural notions were well-meaning. Uh, they were just from the time, uh, the era that we all lived in. And a lot of them infiltrated our therapy techniques. And if any of you went to child, uh, therapy as children, you may have noticed that our field has evolved as it should evolve and continue to evolve as our information evolves. Um, there's also, uh, I'm gonna to touch on some of the societal attitudes and assumptions that uh, still affect the way people view traumatic uh, uh, issues with people uh, that affect our views of criminal justice, that affect our views of substance use and other behaviors um, and are somewhat biased. Um, also, I'm going to address the fact that if you've had multiple traumatic events in your life, the science that the hard outcomes say that you will have an increased risk of suicide, increased risk of suffering from mental illness, increased risk of obesity, pulmonary disorders, risk of suicide, increased risk of drug and alcohol addiction, and increased statistical odds of being a victim of violence. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. And those are how hard medical outcomes. Those are not just situational. So um, objectives, these are all fun. This is something you have to submit for continuing ed. So I'm going to just briefly go over them so I can get to the meat of this. But basically, you'll understand the paradigm. You'll understand the research. Um, you'll be able to understand how to use it somewhat. And you'll understand number four, which is important, uh, that trauma or dysautonomia or PTSD and other symptoms that disrupt the nervous system have a large impact on the general population's mental health. And these effects can be observed throughout society despite socioeconomic status, uh, but may be amplified in uh, segments of the population, especially marginalized populations who are experiencing a disappropriate amount of stress due to their living environment, as well as various cultural and historical factors. So that does bring us to what's very important because a lot of people have understood trauma as just one thing that happens to you. You're having a normal life and you're happy and all of a sudden you get in a car accident or all of a sudden somebody dies that's close to you. Trauma is really hard to explain exactly what it is because there isn't a completely fixed definition yet. Yes, we can say those are traumatic events, but trauma is also what's happening to your nervous system and how that imprint of things that happen to you either stay with you or leave you um, different than how you were before, which is how the brain works in general. So really we're talking about disturbing uh, events that leave an imprint because there are people that have had car accidents that didn't have PTSD or have fear of driving or have uh, nightmares and flashbacks after a couple of days. And other people, they do, and they last for a long time. And it's if, as if the event is not in the past, it's continually happening to their nervous system. Their nervous system is responding as if it's happening now. There are people that have had a, a situation where they were attacked at night, um, walking at night, and who for years later, every time the sun sets, they have jolts in their body, they feel worried, they have intrusive thoughts of people, people harming them. And there are people that have been attacked and maybe they've gone to therapy, maybe they didn't. And then within uh, some time, they were able to overcome this and not have a fear of the dark or fear of strangers. So let's talk about why that is. Uh, trauma, of course, here's a definition for you. Results uh, from an event or a series of events or set circumstances that is experienced by an individual physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening that has a lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and all these areas, mental, physical, social. Now, with those situations, uh, that, you know, that's kind of coming from you know, the little bit of the PTSD diagnosis. Um, but trauma is much larger than PTSD. I don't know if many of you were around for, the, for the, when the DSM-5 was coming out uh, after the DSM-4, and there was a very long delay. Well, part of that delay was because a lot of scientists and doctors were trying to get an expanded definition of trauma and PTSD and expanded different levels of trauma and different nervous system things put into the DSM-5 and most of those were eventually left out. Um, they, uh, I won't say why, but some people thought it would be too complicated to understand and other people just didn't, they wanted trauma to only be PTSD. Um, so 
Although many individuals report a single specific traumatic event, um, especially those seeking mental health or substance abuse treatments, as many have been exposed to multiple or chronic tra traumatic events. And these events can impact everything. So our definition is inadequate. Um, we're talking about the way information, physical events, social events, or perceptions encode in the nervous system. And the way they encode in the nervous system doesn't have anything to do really with our narrative or our morality or the ways that we think things should be in the world. Um, it has to do with the way the brain is remapped. And that brain, the brain can remap in ways that cause us to see things differently as people. It can cause us to act differently. Not that we don't have free will, we do have free will. But part of anyone who's ever had trauma and had an intrusive thought will tell you that it certainly doesn't feel like you have free will. And then that can lead to very bad habits and eventually that overtakes some of your free will. This can lead to personality disorders, anxiety, issues with relationships, substance use. So an easy example that I like to use is um, this. So I'm assuming most practitioners with a master's degree were not children during 9-11, but even if you were a child during 9-11, the attacks on September 11th in New York, most people have a vivid recollection of that day. Um, my, I myself can recall that day as vividly as if it happened yesterday. I can recall a conversation I had. I can recall watching the second plane hit the tower on the TV and, the, and when I was at uh, university. Um, I can recall uh, the concert I was going to attend being canceled. I can recall the voicemail of somebody who was worried because I lived in a large city that my city was going to be attacked. I can recall all these things. So just take a minute, wherever you are, to recall that day. What happened on that day? So now, hopefully none of you lost somebody in that event, and I'm re-triggering you right now, or you know that you were in New York on that day. But so the idea is that the trauma of that day encoded on our nervous systems because it was a random day. Nobody expected um, our country to be attacked and us to be watching it all over the news and not knowing what was going to happen next. However, I'm not having nightmares about 9-11. I'm not worried every time I go to the airport that my plane is going to be hijacked. I'm not worried about climbing up an elevator in a tall building. However, I had a friend who was um, in the building next to the World Trade Center when it went down, and they had escaped, uh, luckily, after the first, they didn't know that it was a bomb, and they were so in shock at seeing the towers fall because they had uh, run away down the street, but they saw it from afar that they walked all the way home five miles across Manhattan to where they lived, covered in ash, looking like a zombie. And they definitely had effects for a while after that um, because of their close proximity to it. So that's an example of something encoded in our brain, but most of us don't have PTSD or a trauma uh, effect from that as much as somebody who was directly there or lost somebody in that. So if you can imagine a traumatic event happening to somebody like as vivid, if something happened to you and it was as vivid as 9-11 is in your brain today, except that then you were, because it happened to you directly, you were assaulted by intrusive thoughts, nightmares. It, it changed the way you viewed the world. It changed your definition of, it changed your spirituality. That is what we're dealing with. And that can be from a major level, from a big trauma, all the way to a small trauma, meaning something small that we didn't know that affected us. Meaning, when I say small, no, every trauma is subjective. So I don't want to say that somebody's experience is small, but I want to say that they may not understand that something like this affected them, right? It may not be in their wheelhouse to understand that. So as Bessel van der Kolk, he wrote The Body Keeps the Score, I recommend that book to everybody. He's a psychiatrist that was on the forefront of uh, basically re -bring, bringing the conversation of trauma back into the fore. And this was during, uh, right after and during the Vietnam War when he started treating veterans is when he started getting interested. And since then, he's done a lot of research. Um, he notes that trauma is specifically an event that overwhelms the central nervous system, altering the way we process and recall memories. That's very important. Altering the way we process and recall. Trauma is not the story of something that happened back then. He adds, it's the current imprint of that pain, horror, and fear living inside people. So 
for people that have experienced trauma, whether it's PTSD or just our general definition of, an, of a nervous system event that is large, <clears throat> it's, it, it currently impacts us. And our nervous system, which is a, a very intelligent part, uh, it takes over. And they, there's even lots of research that I don't go into here where parts of the brain go offline. Your uh, prefrontal cortex, um, part of your Broca's area, different parts of your brain literally start to shut down to protect you and so that only your fight, flight, freeze, uh, collapse, and fawn responses will start to take over. And it's more of an impulsive um, sense in the body. And uh, that's because, uh, for many reasons, we think. But for people with trauma, when they have these thoughts or intrusive thoughts come in or a reminder of maybe the Twin Towers or something going on, they, their nervous system is reacting as if that's happening right now. And this can happen on a major level with PTSD or a minor level. Um, perhaps somebody has had a trouble dating after a humiliation event when they were in middle school. And every time they have the same situation, they get their heart beat and they think that something's happening that's not happening. So that's, that's my, my uh, part of my ability to define trauma in a larger way. And so let's talk about some of the more recent research on this. The Average Child Experiences Study. A lot of people have heard about this study, but I'm just going to go into it. Um, and it was started in 1995 with Kaiser Permanente in San Diego and the Centers of Disease Control. 17,000 patients at Kaiser's Health Clinic. Um, in addition to regular medical questionnaires, they were given uh, an extensive questionnaire regarding childhood experiences of neglect, abuse, family dysfunction, physical and emotional neglect, abuse, sexual abuse exposure to household members who had substance use, prison, or violence in the household. And they were just trying to like, they weren't exactly setting out to study trauma uh, in the way it was. They were just trying to figure out how these adverse child experiences affected people. Um, so let's find out what they found. So uh, they found that the presence of any of these experiences, that means just one of these, was predictive of lifelong problems with health and well-being, including negative physical symptoms and outcomes more likely to, and that people were more likely to suffer from an addiction in adulthood and severe mental health problems. Now that's really huge because uh, before then we had a lot of anecdotal evidence to say, okay, well, kids that were raised in the foster system may have more difficulties with attachment, which may lead to depression or something like that. This study um, at the Kaiser Permanente Institute um, showed this with not only, you know, theories about mental health, but hard outcomes in mental health. Um, the, basically, the more problems that were reported, the higher the adverse child experiences, or ACE score, correlated directly with the likelihood of an individual to encounter severe problems throughout the lifespan. And these were not just mental health or addiction, these were physical health outcomes that we saw. That's huge. So culturally, uh, this finding was potentially disruptive because uh, at the time in our culture, essentially, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like suicide. Suicide, for instance, the suicide hotline was uh, started you know, not only about 25 years ago. Uh, there were other hotlines before that, but Congress wouldn't fund it uh, for the longest time because it was not in our cultural dialogue. It wasn't talked about. It was kind of like, oh, don't, we don't want to talk about that. We want to be in denial about the fact that people are killing themselves all over the United States. So just like that, um, we found that these adverse child experiences were actually exceedingly common, much more than the researchers had thought. Approximately two thirds of participants had gone had undergone at least one adverse child experiences, and more than one in five had endured three or more, which was huge. Um, this started decades of study on this, and obviously it's in, influenced the field of psychotherapy tremendously. Uh, so a little bit more on that. Essentially, uh, trauma-informed counseling was one of the ways that it influenced the field, stressing the importance and recognition of recognizing and treating trauma and preventing additional trauma, which is very important to our presentation today. 
And today, many new modalities have been incorporated into the field of counseling that include a combination of trauma-informed counseling and trauma-specific interventions, such as EMDR therapy, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, somatic experience therapy, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which are tailored to address the effects of precise traumatic events and situations that a person has endured. And there's a lot of other types that are also doing it. In the 1990s, uh, this study was controversial because it messed with the narrative of the nuclear family and normality. Um, so I think it would be interesting for us to actually engage in a little bit of our own ACE uh, study right now. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let everyone, if you've got a piece of paper or an iPad or something like this, you can actually give yourself a score. All you have to do is count um, yes equals one and no equals zero. So obviously, this is a webinar. I'm not going to be seeing any of your answers, but this is going to just give us a little insight um, on you as practitioners. So number, question number one, while you were growing up during the first 18 years of your life, did, you, did a parent or another adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you may be physically hurt? Yes or no? If it's yes, you got one point. So mark that down on your device or your paper. If you said no, zero points. All right, number two. Did a parent or another adult in the household push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Yes equals one point, no equals zero points. Did an adult or a person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way or try to have, actually have oral, anal, or vaginal sex with you? This is an adult or a person at least five years older than you when you were under the age of 18. Yes equals one point, no equals zero points. Did you often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Yes equals one, no equals zero. Now, notice this question is, did you feel that? That is your perception. This is not a fact-based question. This is, did you feel that no one loved you? Did you feel that you weren't important? Did you feel that your family didn't look out for one another or feel close to each other? Question five, did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, that you had to wear dirty clothes and you had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or high to take you to the doctor if you needed it? And this is again, your perception. Did you feel this way? Yes or no? Yes is a one and zero, or no is a zero, okay? So number six, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Pretty easy, yes, one, no, zero. Was your mother, and now I, I would also include father in this, although the original A study said mother because this was the 90s. Was your mother or stepmother often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes or often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or a knife? Yes equals a one, no equals a zero. Did you ever live with anyone who was a problem drinker or an alcoholic or who used any sort of street drugs? Yes would be one and no would be zero. All right, and question nine. Was a household member ever depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Yes is a one, no is a zero. Did a household member go to prison? Yes is a no, or yes is a one and no is a zero, okay. So now not a fun thing to you know, do over the lunch hour, but let's just find out what's going on. So I want you to add up all your yes answers. Now there was 10 questions, so the highest score you can get is a 10. So I'm gonna give everyone 20 seconds to add up their score before I tell you a little bit about what those um, scores might mean. Okay, so everyone should have their score. And what we're going to do now is 
look at this. So this is some of the totals that the initial study had. A whopping two-thirds, and I'll tell you what these scores may mean as we go further. A whopping two-thirds of the 17,000 people in the A study had an A score of at least one, meaning you had one event happen. 80% of, of those had more than one. Uh, and 36 states and the District of Columbia have done their own A studies. Their results are very similar to the A study. So this is just showing you percentages uh, the people that took the test, um, you know, what the percentage uh, was that had over, uh, that had zero A score, that had one A, two, three, four or more. Um, that, and and uh, so here's the implications. So keep your score. Uh, we found a stunning link, of course, between childhood trauma and experiences uh, and dis chronic diseases. Uh, so some of these diseases uh, were heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and autoimmune disorders. And we saw a link between social uh, and emotional problems. Now, these are correlations. Uh, everybody is unique and has their own in unique biology, their own unique epigenetics, their own unique situation that they're living in, their environment, their resiliency, the people in their lives. So just because you have a high A score or low A score doesn't mean that your health is going to be either great or terrible. This just means that there's a correlation in the data. And some of these also included social and emotional problems because you know, our, we do have some will in our life. We, we, have, we have the ability to get help. We have the ability to heal. But these, these scores for your average person, I mean, if we're all practitioners, and I'd hope most practitioners are doing their own type of healing work. Um, and so, you, you know, we may be a bit more resilient than your average person who doesn't, who isn't in our field. Uh, but some people were actually prone to be victims of violence and suicide uh, because of the higher A score. Uh, they've had 70 more publications since 1998 uh, through 2015. I haven't seen it since 2015 data, but uh, what we found was childhood trauma was very common, even in employed white middle-class college educated people with great health insurance. If you know Kaiser Permanente, Permanente it used to be a pretty um, high class insurance company. Uh, so there's that. Um, this was, there was a direct link between childhood trauma and adult onset of chronic disease, as well as depression, suicide, and being uh, violent and a victim of violence. Uh, again, there's increased risk of health, social, economic, prob emotional problems. And uh, people usually experience more than one type of trauma. Rarely is it only sex abuse or verbal abuse. Um, that's some of the studies implications uh, and findings. So here we go. Um, they came up with an ACE score to explain a person's risk for chronic disease. The higher your ACE score, the higher your risk for health and social problems. Uh, of course, other types of traumas could exist that contribute to an ACE score. So it's conceivable that many people could have ACE scores higher than 10, although the ACE study, of course, only did these 10 types, and this was about childhood. Again, we focused on childhood, so imagine uh, the buildup of other adverse experiences throughout a lifetime. And because adverse child experiences seem to set you up for more health problems and social and emotional problems, that could only increase your chances of having more trauma rather than a person who has had a relatively sheltered life and a very low ACE score or maybe a zero, then all of a sudden in adulthood, they run into some difficulties. They are more likely according to these statistics, to be able to overcome that easier without having the long-term issues. Um, as your ACE score increases, so does the risk of disease, social, we said that before. With an ACE score of four or more, that's when things are getting serious. The likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease increases 390%, according to the correlations of the statistics. 240% more likely to have hepatitis, 460% uh, more times likely to have depression and attempted suicide 1,220%. That's if you had a score of four or more versus people with a score of four or less. Um, now, a lot of times people essentially, there was, a, there, we'll get into some more of the cultural pieces, but a lot of people were sort of thinking that Oh, or they were just picking people that were from difficult, you know, had a difficult neighborhood or they were uh, poor or marginalized. 
Um, but actually, in this ACE score study, it was actually mostly white middle class and upper class college people in San Diego with good jobs and great health care um, that were in this ACE study. So that was also surprising to researchers. Now, I said, imagine the impact on the black, indigenous, and people of color community and other marginalized communities in the United States that don't have maybe as, as much of the social resources going uh, in, in their communities. Um, if they're statistically speaking likely to grow up in a community without access to quality of health care, education, or, or health food markets, and other things like that, um, these are all things that can impact their, not, not to say they would have more trauma, but could impact their stress levels. And if you have trauma plus those stress levels, that could increase things even, even further in, that, uh, in those communities. So um, now at the same time the ACE study was done, we had parallel research about toxic stress and how that damages the structure and function of a uh, child's brains. So you can find out more about this at the Child Trauma Academy, but I'm gonna just talk a little bit about it. It was a group of neuroscientists and pediatricians, including um, Martin Teacher, Jack Shontoff, both of Harvard, uh, Bruce McEwen of Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller University, and child psychiatrist Bruce Perry, who is the most famous of this group. Um, so this is what we found. Uh, I, I made this paragraph uh, because I just found this fascinating uh, about children with toxic chronic stress. When children are overloaded with stress hormones, they get into fight, flight, or freeze mode. They can't learn in school very easily. They have difficulty trusting adults or developing healthy relationships with peers. They may become loners. To relieve their anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, or inability to focus, they often turn to easily available biochemical solutions, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, methamphetamines, I would also argue high carbohydrate junk food diets and sugar and soda pop because that's easier to obtain when you're young or activities in which they can escape their problems, high risk sports, proliferation of sex partners and work and overachievement. Um, example, nicotine reduces anger, increases focus and relieves depression, alcohol relieves stress, all of course temporarily. So uh, children, th the toxic chronic stress that these, that children who have a high ACE score or have a lot of trauma in their lives are under, undergoing is changing the structure and their brain and their natural focus is to get relief. Our, as humans, we wanna to adapt to our environment and if our environment is toxically stressful and difficult, we wanna relieve that. And children, um, that's why we have to have parents and teachers involved, they don't know what's really good for them in the long term. They're looking quickly at the short term because that's how their brains are and that's where they are in their development. So why not look at the nearest thing that gives me relief? That's what I'm gonna go for. Um, oftentimes parents and teachers make it about uh, their morality or uh, you know, you're a bad kid or you're a bad behaving child, you're acting out. When in fact, these children are trying to get their needs met, they're just choosing a way that we don't see as acceptable. And that may be harmful in the long term. But again, we're adults. We have the ability to think in the gray. We have the ability to plan over time. We have cognitive functioning that these children do not have. So um, we have to think about that when we label children as acting out and as addicts and um, you know, promiscuous and all of this. We have to think about what are they actually lacking? What, what is needed in their life so that they can start making uh, better decisions? And a lot of it may be supervision and. Uh, nurturing but who knows so that's something that's a whole nother topic so using drugs or overeating or engaging risk behavior leads to consequences obviously um, uh, but there's increasing research that shows that severe and chronic stress leads to bodily symptoms producing inflammatory responses that leads to diseases so um, the severe toxic chronic stress um, leads to its own inflammatory response that leads to chronic diseases that we see right now. So t children with toxic chronic stress, which is parts of the roots of mental illness and substance use, similar to the uh, high A scores, that's already increasing their organ, uh, their organs ability to have a disease. Not only that, but it's increasing their chances of using drugs or overeating or engaging in risky behaviors, which also lead to disease. So part of what I'm saying is not just that trauma-informed counselors can help with mental health, but that we need trauma-informed doctors and we need a trauma-informed medical system. 
uh, uh, that starts looking at people not as the uh, uh, one little piece of their body is having an issue, but looking at the whole structure and why is this happening. Um, certain things, some implications here is that toxic stress can be passed down from generation to generation. Um, the field of epigenetics shows that we are born with a set of genes that can be turned on or off depending on what's happening in our environment. If a child grows up with an overload of toxic stress, their stress response genes are likely to be activated so that they are easily triggered by stressful situations that don't affect those who don't grow up with toxic stress. They can pass this response into their children. We found that out through some of these studies of Holocaust survivors and their children and what um, we found in those uh, genetic studies and disease studies. So that's something to look up. Uh, obviously, as I said, genes can be turned on and off depending out on the environment and stress, which is you know, an epigenetics. If you're not into that, I really recommend learning about that as well. Um, a lot of that can be found in a Norton anthology of interpersonal neurobiology led by Dan Siegel, who's an MD out of UCLA. Um, so let's talk about a little bit more about the ACE study before we go to the good news. I know I've been in the bad news for a lot of this presentation, but I'm about to get to the good news. So don't worry, some good news. So um, we can see here that conception is on the bottom and death is at the top. And we have a whole life perspective here on this pyramid. So there are some gaps, meaning that we have the adverse child experiences study we understand the social, emotional, cognitive impairment. We understand that some of these things can lead to adoption of high-risk behaviors and disease. The scientific gaps are there because we can't prove, the, there's no proof that everyone who has these gets that. It's just a correlation. And we're not exactly sure why that happens in some people and why it doesn't happen to other people. I mean, as practitioners, we could wax poetic all day about why we think some kids who have really high A scores are Practitioners among us. I've met practitioners with A scores of six, seven, eight, and that are amazing practitioners, right? Uh, they definitely had a lot of difficulties in their past, but um, they are now helping people in an amazing dynamic ways, right? So not this doesn't happen to everyone, this early death. So let's just remember, if you're A score, remember we did that earlier. If it's high, don't worry. There's lots of things you can do to retrain the brain from trauma to uh, work on your narrative, to work on your health. So. Let's get into the good news. So neurobiology, um, what we're learning about uh, neurobiology is that uh, our brains and lives are somewhat plastic. Resilient research shows that an appropriate integration of resilience factors, here's some of them, asking for help, developing trusting relationships, forming a positive attitude, listening to feelings, can help people improve their lives. And this is because of the brain. Now, let's take a kid who has a high A score, okay? High adverse child experiences. All of a sudden in school, he's got difficulties with social learning, can't make friends, has cognitive impairments, right? Starts you having high risk behaviors. Now he's labeled, he's that kid in that school. He's a bad kid, don't hang out with that kid. He's from the wrong side of the tracks. He's hanging out with these, uh, you know, kids who they just care about bad stuff, whatever. We're, we're labeling, we're culturally putting our, our BS onto this kid because we're not using the science. We're not seeing what does this kid need? This kid needs a wraparound program. This kid is having these behaviors because of some of these things. Now, if that kid hears that, now we're cementing the narrative that he's a bad kid. Well, shoot, at some point, yeah, we'll lose that. We're, we're gonna lose that kid. That kid is gonna commit crimes. That kid is gonna abuse others. That kid is gonna be a victim of all sorts of violence. Because we, our system, our education system and our, our, uh, our, our social fabric is not set up for prevention. It's set up for crisis and it's set up for um, picking up the pieces and it's set up for dealing with uh, chronic uh, health problems far after they've already been developed. Um, we're not in the, in the in uh, prevention here. So not only do these things happen, but we label the person that leads them to then cementing in their neurons that they are bad. Thus, we have the early death. That's part of it. You've heard this from science class, neurons that wire together, fire together. This means the good news that if we provide children and adults with healing, corrective, and supportive experiences through community resources, the mending of family life, 
enhanced focus on emotional well-being of students at schools, trauma-informed counseling, integrative medical care that focuses on the whole person, et cetera, people may be able to develop resiliency and thus decrease the long-term negative effects from their traumatic experiences. And that is coming from um, Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Bruce Perry and a bunch of others, but those are the two I cherry picked uh, where I got that from. So this is a client, <sighs> client studies, I'm trying to keep them completely anonymous. These are two people I've worked with. I've been doing EMDR therapy since 2009, uh, motivational interviewing, all that stuff I was trained on before that. Um, so client A, uh, she was raped her freshman year of college. This client talked about the rape. She got help immediately at the student counseling center. She talked to her parents about it. She talked to her friends about it. She went to a support group. Eventually she met me. We went through EMDR therapy. We went through all eight phases of EMDR, mostly focusing on the rape. She had not had any other um, rapes or sexual molestation in her childhood. She had had a relatively very supportive childhood. Um, she had a very low ACE score. Um, years later, um, I actually heard from this client recently, and they were doing great. Uh, uh, they were just telling me about their job. Anyway, uh, they have no sexual symptoms or side effects. Uh, they have a healthy relationship, and they feel completely recovered. They feel as if um, the only thing that is that they remember being raped. They don't have the negative traumatic side effects. Uh, client B, also raped freshman year of college, had almost no one to talk with about this. They kept it a secret from their friends. Um, a little bit about their background. The father was absent their whole life, had left uh, by the time they were 16. I believe their father had left the family. Mother was an alcoholic and emotionally unavailable. They did not receive therapy or even confront the fact that she was raped until she was in her 50s. Um, she is suffering from PTSD, autoimmune disorders, multiple, and had a series of difficult romantic relationships. Uh, she's now married to a man that she, in her words, tolerates, uh, but they kind of exist in a big house, not really close to each other. She believes it's too late for her to recover. She suffers from depression and anxiety as well. Um, as you can see, the neuroplasticity here, uh, this victim A, client A, immediately got help. And eventually that translated to her friends helping her, her parents helping her, the support group. She went to EMDR, she did all of these things and then continued talk therapy. And now she's living a life where the only thing she has is the memory of it. And the memory is not no longer assaulting her. The memory is just a memory. It's just, it's, it's, as, it's, it's just an event. It doesn't define her. Client B didn't have anyone to talk with, didn't have a good support system. Um, the brain, you know, her brain, her nervous system got wired in negative ways. She, she did, she had a lot of other problems uh, that are in the ACE pyramid. Difficult, uh, she repeated some difficult romantic uh, relationships, um, has troubles with intimacy. And now it's coding her entire narrative in her life is that it's too late for her. If she would have got help when she was young, it wouldn't have happened. You know, she wouldn't be this way. Um, and, and now, you know, layer after layer after layer of that negative narrative because of the trauma, now she believes this. And, you know, people talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, you know, your core belief. Well, how did that core belief get there? How was that installed? And what, how many layers of nervous system activity installed that along with the narrative? So that's just a little example about neuroplasticity and that people can recover from this. But client B is still having difficulty recovering from her situation, you know, 30, 40 years later, because, uh, this, it, it kept getting reinforced through the myelination of the neurons that she was, you know, a victim and that her life was ruined because of this person and what happened to her. So more implications. Um, we've learned that many people who had mental health symptoms also suffered, uh, suffered physical symptoms because the mind and body are connected. The nervous system begins in the brain and moves throughout the entire body. Um, and it goes both ways. So a lot of people that have had traumatic uh, issues, they, they not only have traumatic thoughts and intrusive thoughts and nightmares, they have physical feelings that continue to bother them to this day. Bessel van der Kolk, um, who quoted earlier, body to keep us safe, 
but it's continually uh, bothering them. Hypervigilance. So uh, the overwhelming evidence from neurobiology and the emerging fields of epigenetics is making it clear that more education is needed for therapists, social workers, and healthcare workers. As many, as many diagnoses that we have today, that even we're giving people today, generalized anxiety disorder, major depression, all real diagnosis according to DSM, they may be the results of trauma, they may be the results of trauma plus the environment, and that all may be the result of somebody's genetics. Now, some people are born with this uh, you know, propensity towards depression or bipolar because of the way that their, uh, their body processes things, but I wanna know why. What is switching on that switch? Is it events or is it you know, a lack of nutrients or is it a lack of serotonin? And why do we have a lack of serotonin versus just treating, oh, they have a lack of serotonin. Here we go. What, what are we doing for the whole person? Um, education, not labels are needed. Uh, over the long term, without actual safety or therapeutic connection, many people who suffer these adverse child experiences or trauma begin to internalize these adverse experiences and to form negative narratives and believe, just like my client B, for example, that they were responsible for their poor upbringing, that they're worthless, that they do not deserve good things, that they can never be truly safe, they can never trust another human, they're not in control of their lives, they're a failure no matter what, etc. These sort of things that you hear in depression, that you hear in generalized anxiety disorder, that you hear with people with attachment issues and personality disorders, um, these things didn't just happen overnight. They, didn't just, they weren't just born with it, usually. It, it happens over time and over time, and it's reinforced, uh, unfortunately, due to you know, that person's what happened to them and, and their perceptions of it. So let's talk about this, a little bit more about the clinician side. Thanks so much for hanging with me. I know we're, you know this is a lot of didactic teaching information, but I honestly am trying to feed you this so that you will get interested in this, that you will learn about this, that you can start uh, bringing this to your practice immediately, that if any of you are getting burned out and cynical and you're starting to judge your patients and calling them resistant and all of this, that you'll understand that there's something deeper going on and there are ways to get training to go deeper. Um, I really like EMDR, I like advanced EMDR. Uh, I like doing parts work. Uh, internal family systems, things like that can really get there for some people, for other people. Yes, I don't, I'm not against a cognitive therapies, but understand how to integrate trauma informed into those cognitive talk therapies. How do you really align with that person? So um, this is important for our field. Uh, we're often presented when we're meeting with the client. Uh, we're, 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 we're given the surface, the narrative, the symptoms, the behaviors. <clears throat> Here's my negative story. Here's my problems, here's my symptoms, here's my behaviors, and we maybe hear information if they're a child from their school, family, doctor, probation officer. When I worked in West Side of Phoenix for a long time, I, a lot of my clients were on probation, so that was something I dealt with all the time. Uh, next, we often work on forming an opinion, analysis, or clinical formulation of what's going on with the client based on our training, our experiences, and our personal cultural biases, you know, our transference. We need to understand while the diagnosis and clinical formulation are necessary to be able to form measurable treatment goals, which is very important, obviously, for our careers, and our paychecks, because it's required by insurance companies and other concerned people, our opinion, our personal opinion about the person is mostly useless. That's from Scott Miller's research, The Common Factors of Therapy, Scott Miller, PhD. The reason our opinion is useless uh, is because we have to deal with what's going on with us. And uh, what's going on with us has been informed, um, you know, like I'm almost 40, and so I got all sorts of cultural trash growing up. Uh, it's all in the media, it's in the papers, uh, we label people, we judge people, that's all there. Then I went to therapy, you know, counseling school, and I'm supposed to be able to be non-judgmental, but yet still judge people to figure out what's wrong with them. So we have to really, we have a hard, we have a hard job ahead of us. I know a lot of people who are just getting out of graduate school have emailed me and said, well, hey, I actually got really good trauma-informed uh, counseling skills in my graduate school. And I say, well, good, because they're needed. Um, because when people don't want to go back to therapy and they, 50% of people after the first session of therapy never return, that's, that's ridiculous. Why is that? 
Well, I, I, I would say it's not the clients. I would say we need to do a better val job at uh, making that person feel valued and, and uh, making them have something out of it. So we need to address our cultural encapsulation. Uh, we need to evaluate our personal experiences, our own strengths and our shadow. We need to engage in our personal work. We need to understand that the client's narrative symptoms behaviors are only the surface. They're, they're what's coming up above the water that we can see. What are the roots? What's underneath the water? What's underneath the dirt? The adverse child experiences and the adverse adult experience trauma are the roots of a lot of negative narratives, the presenting problems or symptoms and negative behaviors. Those are, that's what's going on beneath the surface. Their stories. Maybe they didn't exactly have trauma. We can not call it trauma, but they've had these experiences. They shape the way they think. These have been reinforced by their brain. And, but many of our interventions are focusing on the problem. We're, we're not pulling out the roots. We're just snipping the grass. We're just snipping the weeds. Um, now, I said this a little earlier. Is basically one theory about why, why are we doing this? Why were we taught to do mostly talk therapy and all talk about the logic when <clears throat> somebody whose nervous system is reacting to trauma isn't able to really fully access their logical brain? Why is that? Um, I think it's because this hasn't fully made its way into graduate schools and the textbooks. Um, and that's what we need to be doing. Um, we need to be looking at the paradigm. So let's talk about treating the surface a little bit more. So many of our counseling therapeutic techniques were developed over the last 120 years, and many were unintentionally ego-based. I'm the practitioner. You're the sick person. I know what's right for you. You don't. This sort of thing. Um, we built in an unhealthy power dynamic. Patient's ill. The clinician is healthy. Um, and we're focusing on engaging the prefrontal cortex of the logic center when really a lot of people are experiencing a nervous system reaction that has rendered the prefrontal cortex online. And we know that from MRI studies. We know that from uh, neurobiology studies. Uh, and so we have to understand that talk therapy can go so far and it goes really well with people that are well regulated and have a good um, healthy attachment and have a good nervous system, have a good support system. Talk therapy is great but we need to be able to bring in other, other interventions for people who are not in that situation. Our therapy still contains relics of cultural prejudice and even religious dogma. If any of you were around for DSM-3 to DSM-4, I think DSM-3 was when they finally pulled out that if you uh, were a gay person, that that wasn't a mental disorder. Um, this is, that was 1980, okay? So we're not that far out of this. Um, our, a lot of our old therapy techniques that we were taught uh, have antiquated assumptions or they're antiquated science and there's assumptions about people um, as well as out -judge, outdated judgmental, judgmental metaphors such as your brain is a malfunctioning computer. It's just malfunctioning. That's what it's doing. Um, the brain is not a computer that's just malfunctioning. It's got a reason that it's malfunctioning. Just like when my computer malfunctions today, I'm going to take it to the computer guy and or person, excuse me, and the computer person is going to go, oh, let's look at what happened here. Let's do some diagnostics. Oh, that's why your computer shut down in the middle of your presentation. <laughs> it's because of this. We have to look at the why. Why does my brain say these things? Why am I having these cognitive distortions? What, what is going on? And we need to make sure that we understand that people are not broken. People have definitely problems and they definitely have symptoms which are the signals that they have problems but we need to make sure we are not in reinforcing the idea that a person is broken and that they're dependent on us we want to from day one say we're coming alongside of you as a practitioner we're helping you we're not going to just fix you and you're not broken you have some work to do for sure but we're here for the ride um we want, to, uh, we want to be careful because this is in our culture. Educa education systems, public and private, often lack the latest scientific information. They also lack funding. And they lack uh, on how to help children who may be suffering from cro chronic toxic stress, you know, average child experiences, and rely on baseless cultural tropes for ca classroom management, like good and bad behavior, old school language about this. Um, and it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult world for those of you who have been teachers. I was a teacher before. The criminal justice system. Uh, we believe, not all of the criminal justice system, but a good portion of it believes that punishment of drug users 
works. That's one example. There's zero evidence that punishing drug users works. Um, it, it does not. Uh, working with drug users to increase their, uh, their, their ability to have fun and joy and connection without drugs works. And lots of other things work, but punishment doesn't. The prison, the prison industrial conflict, uh, complex for, and the for-profit prison complex incarcerate substance users for years without any rehabilitation or treatment. This is in, this is in the water we live in. Some religious institutions use shame, guilt, and power to keep their system running. This is in, our, in the water we're drinking. Um, we have judgmental cultural narratives. I mean, I've lived in many different states, and it's surprising to me that in places, some places I've lived, um, it just seems that people are more open to people's experiences where other people are saying, oh, they're that person, they're this person, they're othering people. Um, so therapists and social workers who are not trauma-informed and deliver their own cultural judgments upon clients, especially difficult or resistant ones, uh, that is reinforcing the negative narrative uh, based on the surface of what we're seeing. That's the title of this slide. We're reinforcing that. Healthcare professionals um, who are not trauma-informed may freely give their opinions or judgments upon a person's behavior and tell them to, quote, stop it. So like, I don't know, but like a regular doctor's office who doesn't know motivational interviewing may say, oh, you just need to stop smoking, stop drinking, you're too fat. Um, I had a client who recently went to a um, OBGYN and the person told them, uh, you know, that they needed to do all this diet work and they didn't even look at the chart and the person's main diagnosis in the chart was eating disorders. <laughs> they had anorexia and so it was, and now they were overweight. So the doctor said, oh, you should lose weight. So it's like, we need to be looking a little bit deeper here. Um, interventions that don't work for those experiencing trauma or whoever experienced trauma. Um, advice giving does not work. Behavioral modification does not often work um, unless it's uh, from a strength-based way. Confrontation does not work. Uh, a lot of uh, exposure therapy does not work. It just reinforces the trauma. Uh, most cognitive behavioral therapies, excluding trauma-focused CBT, Psychoeducation on the consequences. These are the bad things that'll happen to you if you continue to do this. Um, because we're not taking into place why the nervous system is using uh, these behaviors. Um, punishment, that the uh, punishment doesn't work. Uh, we have to reinforce the positive. We have to de-incentivize the negative. And yes, some people do need to be incarcerated for the safety of the public. I understand that, uh, but uh, we have to be able to figure out who's rehabilitatable and who's who's not able to be rehabilitated and uh, instead of putting everybody in the same thing forever. And for those people that do EMDR or different trauma specific interventions, we have to make sure we don't move too quickly um, because that that will that could possibly disrupt or deregulate uh, people as well. Essentially, I wanted to bring a little bit of uh, information about how discrimination on marginalized groups can lead to some toxic chronic stress and adverse child experiences. So uh, the effects of discrimination as noted in this study, some symptoms include fear and hypervigilance, headaches, insomnia, body aches, memory difficulty, self-blame, confusion, and guilt. Um, I'm not going to go to in terms of time. I'm not going to go totally into this and watch this video, but you will have the slides to watch this later. Uh, internalized depression, uh, believing and making it part of your self images image, the myth and information that society specifically the group of position and power communicates to your group. So there was a study about the doll study and they were asking all these children, they were African American children, um, which was the good, if there was a good doll or a bad doll and they all, and, almost all of the African-American children, because they were a, m a minority group um, and had been watching television, this was in the 90s, and most of the characters were white characters, uh, they always picked the white doll as the, um, the good one and the, and the black doll as the bad one. So these are things that can happen even in a subtle way. Um, that I don't see that as subtle, but can help. And so if you're working with people that have been marginalized or are minority groups, we have to understand how they may even 
be at more risk of toxic chronic stress and adverse child experiences. And I'm going to let you guys have the, uh, have the slides to be able to look up the doll study just because of time. So <clears throat> before we get into that, I feel like we're, lo we're losing a few people here at this point, but um, I'm going to get into what we can do, but I wanted to make sure we get into this. So effects of discrimination on marginalized groups continued. Um, it's difficult to heal if you don't feel like people in power are, are looking out for you. Uh, difficult to heal from other traumas when you're not acknowledged and having accountability. Um, there has been proven that it increases susceptibility to develop additional mental health problems. This is in the literature. It negatively impacts one's ability to succeed and function and might, severe, might serve as triggers to other memories um, of discrimination and leading to re-traumatization. Uh, oh, thank you for your nice comment. Uh, mental health statistics. So this is just about marginalized participation uh, groups and minority groups. African American women are ex who experience combination of racism, sexism, are reported greater stress and reduced self-esteem. References at the end. Immigrant women are hot at a higher risk of postpartum depression than non-immigrant women. LGBTQ youth are three times more likely to commit suicide. Have a 120% higher risk of experiencing homelessness. That's from NAMI. 40% of transgender adults have attempted suicide in their lifetime compared to less than 5% of the uh, general US populations. So why would I include this information in the middle of this trauma-informed counseling um, presentation? It's because not only do we need to understand what's happening in our cultural subgroup, whoever you are, and in my cultural subgroup, I could easily identify with the ACE study because I was a white, lower middle class person growing up. And that's what that study was on. So if that study is happening for a group that's pretty well resourced and has quite a lot of political and social power in my country, and I never felt scared because I was white when I was a kid, I can only imagine if I wasn't white and I didn't, I didn't grow up in a lower middle class neighborhood and uh, didn't have those resources, how would that affect me? That can only affect my nervous system in a negative way further. So, um, thank you. A lot of people apparently have clients now. I'm getting some chats that people have to run, but here we go. So we're gonna keep going. Um, this is an interesting uh, one. Uh, most strikingly, only 1.9% of Asians report lifetime PTSD in contrast to 7.8% of African-Americans, 6.9% of non-Latino whites and 6.3, and you, you can see that. And I, I don't fully understand why that is, but um, a few friends of mine that um, are of Asian descent um, did say that they felt that that could be because the community of um, Asians in, in the US are, are more collectivist and, and were able to talk together. I know that's sort of a stereotype perhaps, but it is also more culturally in, in um, the countries. In, in a lot of Asian countries to have that. We're all one view. We're in the US, it's like, we're all, you know, individualized, our little pot, our little family. That's what, you know, we see you know, our little school. We're, we're kind of in our little groups or even individualists versus the, uh, the Asian culture. Uh, so I found that interesting anyway. So now back to a little bit of what we can do. So the trauma-informed care paradigm. Um, we want to be able to uh, move this into our services and understand the impact it can have of the trauma can have and the awareness and the impact it can have on the different populations we work with. Um, it, it, we have to involve viewing trauma through an ecological and cultural lens and recognizing the context and a significant role in how us and individuals perceive and process traumatic events, whether acute or chronic. Trauma-informed care is also known as TIC, so I'm abbreviating. It involves vigilance in anticipating and avoiding institutional processes and individual practices that are likely to re-traumatize individuals. And I see those, and when I was working in difficult uh, neighbor, neighborhoods, um, okay, I've got a few questions. I'm gonna get to those at the end. When I was working in, uh, in those neighborhoods, I. I saw, I saw it right there in the system. You know, people, people were annoyed 
the police officers were annoyed. The hospital was annoyed when people came in with a lot of trauma because they were the most difficult clients sometimes. And I mean difficult meaning disruptive. They weren't as compliant. So we have to be able to adapt as healthcare practitioners, okay? We have to adapt to be able to figure out ways to intervene in ways that are holistic. And, and there is much more coming out about this and, and we're still lacking in this and, and I'm lacking in this. I'm in an outpatient office. How do I adapt? How do I adapt my services to somebody whose nervous system is off the charts, traumatized all the time? Um, we have to understand the biological and behavioral foundations of human adaptation. We're always adapting. Um, so every change or human behavior human beings engage in is an attempt to adapt to what's happening in our environment at the time and seek safety. This is what we know from science. This is the involvement of learning about what trauma is. These are some of the nervous system responses. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and collapse. I'll explain all of those. Many behaviors of those experiencing trauma happen at a pre-conscious level and only later, only later, when the shock has worn off, do we humans make up a story of why something happened. So we will often react and then make up a story because that's how the nervous system works. Um, it's faster than our brain can even have cognition. Other times, people may be reacting to trauma months or years later and will continue to make up a story even before they act, a rationale. Um, basically, if the story is intertwined with the result of fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. So essentially, like, um, somebody may just be afraid of trains because they had a friend who got hit by a train, and they may just make up a story about that that has nothing to do with the actual event. Um, Due to the judgmental nature of our culture, people are often making up stories constantly about without really understanding the full story nor the impact of the hidden trauma that may be underneath. Um, if, let's talk about the autonomic nervous system. Uh, if you've experienced a stressful event where you fell out of control and utterly powerless, your autonomic nervous system was significantly engaged. Uh, it's basically the ANS is responsible for regulating between parasympathetic and sympathetic. Parasympathetic is rest and digest emotional regulation. If I were to slow down my caffeinated talk right now, and we all do a mindfulness exercise, you would begin to experience some parasympathetic responses. However, the sympathetic responses that the ANS is responsible for are fight, flight, freeze, fawn, collapse, and avoid. Um, these can be uh, these are automatic responses through the autonomic nervous system that happened without us thinking about it. For instance, if we're, some people when approached by a person who might hurt them will fight. Some people are programmed to run. Some people will freeze or fall over. Some people will try to get that person to like them and to try to please them by fawning and saying, here's my wallet or what do you need from me? Some people will collapse into the ground. Obviously we'll avoid as much as possible. Um, also, we are getting pituitary gland activity through hormonal messages, um, and the adrenal glands are, are located. So we're getting epinephrine uh, and, and that going on as well through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Obviously, this isn't <laughs> biology class, but you can, you can learn about this stuff. So when the, this nervous system is activated, uh, we have these uh, stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, and these glands enable the body to instinctually prepare to face danger. So Peter Levine, many of you know him from the uh, PhD as the father of somatic experiencing therapy. He stated that when uh, trauma occurs, uh, when the natural, he say, stated that a trauma occurs when the natural biological process to fight, flight, freeze, all that is overwhelmed during an incident. Meaning that we couldn't, we were not able to do what we needed to do. Our whole system was overwhelmed. And later on, the individual is not capable of physically releasing or psychologically processing the event that occurs. So it keeps reoccurring in their mind over and over, like Bessel van der Kolk discussed, we're re-experiencing it. And that's what's going on in the nervous system. There's a really cool thing here. I don't have time to explain it all. Uh, you can find this um, online. 
<clears throat> trauma brain processing. It shows all the parts of the brain involved. Check it out on Google. A bit about science. Uh, physical release or storage. So a stressful event may not become a traumatic event stored in the nervous system if a person is able to fully process what has occurred psychologically and also release the energy physically. So an example of this, if you have a dog, is that if they're upset, they may shake afterwards, right? A lot of humans, we don't do a lot of exercise. Um, we are sitting in chairs all day. Uh, we're not shaking things off. Our culture doesn't have shaking events. Um, for most people, it's not that easy, obviously. There's not a one-size-fits-all. A lot of people have complex psychological and historical factors, environmental factors that can lead to a trauma being stored in the body through the nervous system. So, uh, let's see, you got another chat here. Let's see what they're saying. Oh, whoops, sorry. Apparently people thought this ended at three. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, a bit about the science, the autonomic nervous system. Uh, nonetheless, if the stress response is not processed post-event, the effects will remain in the autonomic nervous system, causing both physical and psychological symptoms. So not only are we learning that this is stored in the memory, this is also stored in the entire autonomic nervous system. So thus, people are getting these symptoms. One example is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, let me explain that. So a, a person may post event, post the stressful event or adverse child experience or to toxic, tonic, toxic chronic stress, a person may come across a situation that does not present a significant threat. However, if the ANS, the autonomic nervous system, subconsciously or consciously recalls the traumatic incident, all of a sudden through the brain and through the part of the nervous system, it automatically releases stress hormones. And subsequently, a person may develop a whole host of negative symptoms. One would be post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's what you're talking about when we're talking about triggered. Everyone's been talking about what is triggered. A stress trigger post-event may result in blood rushing to the extremities, pupil dilation, muscle tension, increased breathing, rapid heart rate, and sweating. Some people mistake these for panic attacks. Um, it might even be a panic attack. So essentially, the autonomic nervous system responds in a sympathetic way, not parasympathetic, to both life threatening events that are significant, and this is the key point for everyone out there, insignificant non-life-threatening events that appear subconscious, meaning that the reminder of a trauma or the reminder of the fact that my school didn't have any people to talk to or the reminder of somebody that hurt me can be enough to bring somebody's autonomic nervous system um, to erupt and make them not be able to think logically. Uh, all right, so this is where thinking goes offline. Oh, fun effect there. So for most people, rational thinking or logical analysis does not easily control the biological responses of the autonomic nervous system. For when you are caught up in a sympathetic response cycle, you will not be able to, quote, think your way out of it. And that's why I said, you, if you're doing CBT, you've got to be trauma-informed because not everybody is in, the, is in a uh, parasympathetic state and is able to think logically about their issues. If you experience chronic stress post-event, it may cause a vicious pattern of emotional dissociation, and we've, that's a whole nother lecture, immobility, freeze, ongoing release of stress hormones, which can lead to blood pressure among other symptoms and cause damage to one's overall health. And that is some of what I think we're seeing in the um, adverse child experiences studies. <coughs> so here's why we know some of this. The brainstem, what scientists call the most primitive part of the brain, evolved to keep us alive and safe. Obviously, Oh my gosh, there's a bear. I need to be alive. My, my, my nervous system is programmed to keep my body alive because my nervous system is part of my brain. And if I'm worried about a bear attacking me, I'm not going to be thinking about how I want my steak seasoned, okay, or how I want my vegetables cooked. It's overriding higher order concerns. It's not, I'm not going to be worried about my, my stock account or whatever. I'm not going to be worried about my car. I'm not even going to be thinking about, it's going to interfere with my short-term memory retrieval in the midbrain. Um, whether this uh, thought, this threat is real or perceived, it causes the ANS, the autonomic nervous system, to jump into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, collapse, um, and it overrides the more evolved part of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex up here. This is likely... Uh, why it is difficult to utilize reason and rationality and calling, telling people to calm down. When a sympathetic response is occurring in the body, 
sometimes people that have a lot of trauma, they are so good at masking the fact that their whole body is in a, in, in a, in a state of flux. They, they, they have this perceived competence when they're actually freaking out because they've learned to adapt. Um, thus, one, when one is suffering the effects of trauma in one's life, they should not feel ashamed if they cannot calm down when someone suggests that they do. So <clears throat> I realize we're getting a little short on time and I wanna make sure I answer some questions, but um, give me three more minutes, we'll see if we can get through. So here's some common experiences and responses to trauma, you can just check these out. Emotional, dysregulation, symptoms, numbing, physical symptoms, somaticization of um, feelings in the body, uh, stomach aches, uh, things like that, heartbreak, hyperarousal, sleep disturbances, triggers or cues, flashbacks, trauma-induced hallucinations, delusions. And I could go through these forever. So there's cognitive issues. Um, you can, uh, the, the whole way we see the world is changed. The force, uh, foreshortened future. Um, cognitive, uh, cognitive errors. Uh, disruption of core beliefs. These, are, these can all come from trauma. Misinterpreting current situations because of the way the brain is being affected. I'm not going to go through all these. Excessive or inappropriate guilt. You've seen this with depression. Um, they're trying to maintain or gain control over a traumatic experience by assuming responsibility or possessing survivor's guilt because others who experienced the same trauma did not survive. You see that in war veterans a lot. Um, intrusive thoughts and memories constantly would be terrible if all day, every day, you kept remembering some awful event or just came into your mind when you're trying to relax. Perceptions of self and others can be altered. Dissociation can occur. Behavioral problems. We talked about that earlier. Self-medicating, impulsive behaviors, self-injurious behaviors. Um, others, uh, some people engage to numb out or self-medicate and avoid. Some people reenact these things to try to overcome the trauma. Um, <clears throat> I've heard of people acting out sexually because they were sexually abused and they wanted to have control in the sex, um, things like that. Reenactments. Uh, a hallmark symptom of trauma is re-experiencing the trauma in various ways, re-experiencing through reenactments. Um, you know, for instance, you could see it in children by um, pretending to crash an airplane into a toy building after seeing the televised events of the terrorist attacks in the World Trade Center 9-11. Uh, whole thing there. Resilient responses. Now, some people have resilient responses. Um, when a trauma happens, there's increased bonding with family and community if they have a good family and community, okay? We have a redefined or increased sense of purpose if they um, have the support to process this, right? Some people have a trauma and then because of the economic system, it's like, okay, back to work on Monday, no time to process. Work, work, work. We have no time to process. Um, increased commitment to personal mission sometimes when people have resilience. Revised priorities Okay, but this usually happens within the context of a supportive family or a supportive friend group and a supportive a, a community that isn't feeling dangerous. Practitioners that understand you and don't label you because of your trauma. Remember this. Um, there is also the negative stuff, self-destructive behaviors. All, and this is all coming from the trauma-informed uh, care module that the government put out. A lot of this is coming from that, this, this section. Uh, this has been proven in... in uh, and lots of studies here. I'm going to get to your questions. So substance use, we talked about a lot of this stuff. Avoidance, that's one of the main symptoms of PTSD. So trauma, I like to do, I like to go to the base definition, which is it can be understood as an extraordinarily stressful experience in life that has a lasting negative impact on somebody. That's the layman's definition. I've taken you through um, a lot of the science I would love to get into how we view mental illness um, because I think we're viewing mental illness in a very uh, 19th century lens, um, which reduces the person to uh, a part versus the sum of the parts. That's a whole part of this presentation that I probably uh, can't get to today. So, um, uh, we talk about nature and nurture, epigenetics, we can talk about, you know, it's both nature and nurture. We can view what mental illness is. And eventually we'll talk about how do we promote awareness? A lot of it's education, a lot of it's safety, a lot of it's withdrawing judgments, a lot of it's looking at the context. 
A lot of what we're trying to do is not uh, replicate prior trauma or trauma dynamics. We want to support the client's choice. We want to support their control and the treatment. I mean, there's so many things here that you can look up. The trauma-informed treatment principles. Those are actually online. This is actually not something I made up. The trauma-informed treatment principles. That is actually from the trauma-informed care manual. So um, <clears throat> we will not go over negative quotes from practitioners. Um, I would say this though, I do think that it will be interesting to go over this slide here, which is, as I ask questions, um, what I say to practitioners is in general, you can only lead people on the journey as far as you've gone. Transform people, transform people. Transformed people, transform people. When you, when you can be healed yourself and not just talk about your healing, you are, as Henry Nowen said, a wounded healer. Richard Rohr said that, who's a philosopher. So are you ready to work on yourself too? Because if you work on yourself, it's gonna equip you to work with your clients even better. Um, okay, so <clears throat> mindfully, just check on your reactions to my presentation. I didn't get through all of it, obviously, but are you noticing an urge to fight? Argue with the presenter, seek alternative explanations, run back to the classic textbooks from uh, the 1960s. Are you noticing an urge to flight? Exit the conference before other presentations or move into the denial of new information. Are you noticing a freeze? Perhaps this information was overwhelming to you and you're not sure what to do about it. Are you noticing an urge to fawn? Pretend to acquiesce to the information. You have no intentions of getting further information. These are all traumatic responses. I'm just trying to see if this happened to anybody. Are you on the verge of collapse? Perhaps this has disrupted what you thought was treatment and thus you feel like giving up. I'm saying do not give up. This is a learning experience. We can all work to integrate this further. There's so much more information. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I wanna open it up to questions. Here's some of my references you can see here. Um, <clears throat> I have a podcast. If you wanna to subscribe to that, you can connect with me. That's probably the easiest way to connect with me is um, go on the Intentional Clinician Podcast or just look up Paul Krause, um, counselor, shoot me an email. I would love to uh, connect with you all uh, on LinkedIn or through email.